and welcome to Conversations on Climate. My name is Chris Caldwell and this series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club. Our guest today will need no introduction to the London Business School community. Professor of Management Practice, Linda Gratton, a genuine titan in her field. Linda has written numerous popular and award-winning books that have been translated into over 20 languages. A Fellow of the National Academy of Human Resources, regularly named in the top 20 thinkers in the world by Thinkers 50, and a frequent contributor to the Financial Times, The Times, the BBC, Channel 4, Sky, The Economist, and the Harvard Business Review. Linda has always held that organizations should put people at the center, that flexibility and continual growth is essential, that work should be more human and humane, that the world is continually changing and pressures of demographics, climate and technology cannot be ignored, that lifelong learning is essential and that cooperation and democratic values within the firm matter. Knowledgeable and motivated on the subject of climate, it is consistently in the background of Linda's work. Two of her biggest books on the future of work and change list the climate emergency as one of the fundamental driving forces in the world today. Speaking to Linda from a lecture hall in the North Building, the newest addition to the LBS campus, we covered a lot of grounds. That included the place of business in society today, lessons from the pandemic, the future of work, transitioning and reskilling in the oil industry, diversity, talent, and the purpose in a changing world. Professor Grattan is a compelling and knowledgeable speaker, a hugely respected global leader on how businesses and individuals can succeed in a changing world. It was a great conversation that I hope you enjoy. Around 80% of people who listen to this podcast haven't hit the follow button. If I could ask you for a small favour, if you do enjoy our conversations, please do hit that follow button on your app. It would help us in the show more than I could possibly say. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Um, Professor Grattan, thank you so much for uh, speaking to us today. It's a real honour and pleasure for you to take the time out of your very busy schedule. Oh, I so appreciate the conversation. We you started out your career as a psychologist. Still am. I still are. And um, your kind of PhD uh, was written on kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, oh, like you know that, that that wonderful wonderful paper. Um, what first brought you into the you know the, the field of psychology, and then how it related into you know the, the future of work? Well, I've always been fascinated with work. I mean, I'm one of those kids who worked, for, one of those people who worked from you know the age of eight with my first paper round, and then I worked on assembly lines in a chocolate factory and waitressing and so on. So I understood work really early on. And so what I was interested in and still are is the relationship between work and people. It's that interface that really fascinates me. Now, of course, once I joined London Business School, that got wider because I then looked at organizations. So now, for example, in my elective on the future of work, we start with the whole globe, the world, and then go back down, you know, what are the forces that are changing the world? What does that mean for companies? What does it mean for teams? What does it mean for you? So the psychologist is still there. Okay, fantastic. What have you learned from teaching about the world of work? Well, what I've done really from the beginning of my uh, career here at London Business School, I've been here for 30 years, is I run a parallel sort of life. So I have my teaching, but I also have a consortium of companies uh, uh, at any time up to 40 companies that I actively research with. So what I do is I learn from both of those, from how students think about the world and how uh, leaders think about the world. And then I also connect them quite a lot. So, for example, in my elective, some of my companies go and teach my students. So we, I try to connect the student learning to what's going on in large and complex organizations as tightly as I can. So where we'd really like to start is um, with, oh, a few years uh, years ago, you wrote a book called The Key. Yes. Uh, which was a, you've described it as a, as, as a love letter to corporations. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, you were very positive about, you know, the place that uh, corporations can have in society and uh, the impact that that corporates can have uh, as long as they make changes yeah. uh, and in the face of big challenges, including including climate yeah. um, and technology as well. How do you think 
corporations have done in relation to that? Like, have they have they fulfilled your your love or still unrequited? <laughs> oh, I'm still in love with corporations. I mean, some I love more than others. I certainly love corporations a lot more than I love politicians and leaders and po political leaders at the moment. Um, because I think, you know, the difference between the political leaders and corporate leaders is the selection process to get to the top of Shell or BP or Equinor is rather different from the selection process to become a prime minister or the, the leader of a country. So, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I wrote the key specifically to address the question that my MBA students were asking me, which is what do corporations do? And what I realised, and this is really what the key was about, is that there are capabilities that companies have. For example, their capacity to innovate, you know, their capacity to create complex shareholder ecosystems, um, their capacity to, to really leverage their distribution. And those three capabilities were things which I felt could really uh, make a difference to, to the world. And so in the key, I talk quite a lot about how corporations can make a difference to the world. And I'm still, um, positive about that. I still work with CEOs on some of those issues. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, yeah. You mentioned politicians aren't exactly popular these days, which is very true. But arguably, neither are corporations. Um, you have there's a, bit, a lot a lot of stick going towards big tech now. Uh, a lot, there's been a lot of stick going to you know the oil and gas industry for for, yeah. for a long old time. Fashion is getting an awful lot of stick. Um, is there a realistic path back um, to to kind of to reputation? Uh, reputationally for these corporations or is regulation really needed and can we trust the politicians to be doing that? Well, you know, that that's a really interesting question. The truth is that if you think about a corporation, it's it's the corporation itself, it's the people it employs, and it's it's the product it sells. Now, if you think about that, most of us trust the products that we buy. So we, you've just flown Last night, I don't know if you flew British Airways, you might not like British Airways, but you trust their product, you got onto their plane. You're just about to probably use one of the millions of Unilever products, you, you trust that. So the first point to say is, people sort of often trust the products. I mean, we might hate technology companies, but we all have you know, iPhones and so on and so forth. The second thing is, what I'm interested in is how employees feel about their corporations. And in the main, people are engaged with their organizations or else they, they, they leave. So um, I, I think, you know, the, the challenge really is, is the, the, the rhetoric between what a corporation says it's going to do and what it actually does. And I think that's where trust begins to erode, where companies make um, far-fetched claims about, you know, the impact they're having on the environment. And anyone who, who looks deeply at that realizes that that's not the case. I think the other point is, frankly, that you know the world is on a very you know tough course at the moment and of course we speak at just the moment that politicians around the world are talking about climate change and we're all deeply worried and we're we're pointing fingers at who who's responsible for this the truth is all of us are you know the fact you got on a plane last night you're responsible for it the fact we're sitting here with all these lights and we're responsible for it so that's one of the things that I talk to my students about in my program, my elective on the future of work, is that this is a multi-stakeholder issue. And it's a bit the tragedy of the commons, which is to say everybody would like to blame somebody else, when in fact the tragedy of the commons is that we're all responsible. And I think that's really where we stand at the moment. Uh, and But there are some great CEOs, and you, you know them better than I, who are you know, trying to make a difference to the world. And I've always felt that corporations well-governed can be very positive forces, uh, but that governance is really important. Yeah, yeah, that's part of the reason why, why we do, you know, these, yeah. uh, because we think that there's, a, there can be a really positive impact from um, speaking to particularly MBA students, like people, yeah. people who have been then going out into the world yeah. of work, into leadership positions, and then hopefully they'll be influence their organizations. The organizations can then kind of filter down into society at large. And frankly, if you can get mm -hmm. the organizations to be going to net zero, that's 60 percent of the problem. Um, but if we kind of move on a little bit to mm -hmm. kind of, you know, lessons from the pandemic and trying to kind of draw parallels between that yes. and maybe maybe climate yes. change. Now, what, how sticky it is or not, I'm not sure. But there's been quite a change um, in the ways that people have been working as a result of the global pandemic. Um, you use um, a really interesting model, kind of the freeze on freeze mo model, mm -hmm. uh, model uh, Kurt Lewins, to describe the, the, the pandemic and how... Um, that type of you know, big shift 
mm. has caused us all to rethink the way we work. And that's been quite successful. Mm. Why has a similar change not happened in relation to climate? Like it's another mm. big global well, issue. Well, that's, that's a brilliant question, isn't it? Um, and I've been asking myself the same questions because just let's just just speaking of the pandemic for a moment. You perhaps remember I wrote the the uh, Harvard Business Review article that was the front cover of HBR on making hybrid work. And my lead lead in case was Fujitsu. And the reason I chose Fujitsu, Tokyo based Japanese uh, company, is because, you know, of all the countries in the world who find it difficult to change working practices, it's Japan. And yet within a week, Fujitsu had moved 60,000 people from their offices in Tokyo into their home. It took them three days to do it. If you'd asked them to do it as a strategy, they'd say it's a five-year program. Well, we, it's just impossible. And of course, you, I mean, you all know the, the analogy of throwing the frog in the boiling water. And so that was, those were, we were thrown into the boiling water. And, and, and I think that just showed how astonishingly adaptive we are. The fact that we did adapt so quickly. And I think, by the way, that's a lot to do with technology. The, the fact that we could all use Microsoft and Zoom platforms, the fact that we had internet connections into our homes, that made a massive difference. And even 10 years ago, I don't think it would have been the same effect. So, so there was, we got thrown into the boiling water, you know, in a second. In that day, in one day, actually, all over the world, all companies got thrown into boiling water. And they either clamoured out of it as fast as they could, or they, or they boiled to death. And also, it was a relatively simple uh, outcome in the sense that you could look to pharmaceuticals to say, when are you going to be able to you know, find a vaccine? You could look to governments to say, how are you regulating how we mix with each other? You could look to corporations and say, I want to work from home, I want to be safe. I think the challenge with, with the climate is we are frogs. We're boiling really, really slowly, but of course we're boiling a lot faster now. So we haven't had that sort of, you know, moment of unfreeze. Uh, and it's very complex. You know, when I teach, I open my program at London Business School on the future of work with climate. Uh, and I get usually one of the heads of strategy from one of the large uh, uh, oil companies, very often Shell, sometimes BP, sometimes Equinor, to talk about how they're you know, how they're thinking about it. And one thing they all say is the complexity of the challenge. You know, the fact that there are multi-stakeholders. With the pandemic, we just used a technology that was already there. Microsoft and Zoom were already there. But here, we have much more complex technology. So the technological challenges are great. The behavioral challenges are great. You know, we aren't changing our behavior. You're still getting on a flight. I'm, st I'm on a flight next week. I'm sorry, I don't mean to blame you, but I'm the same. Uh, I'm still living in a house that's probably overheated and driving a car that's not electric. You're probably doing the same. So, so none of us really are doing everything we need to do in the way that we did with the pandemic. I mean, I spent one year sitting in my home during the pandemic. You did as well. Nobody's done that about climate change. This is very true. And so what lessons can the um, communicators of, you know, the climate change and the challenges that, that we um, are facing, what lessons can, can the communicators learn from the pandemic? And how... I'm not sure that there is very much that we can learn. I mean, the pandemic was a very extraordinary event. You know, I've written a book, Redesigning Work, which was really based on our experiences of the pandemic and what it's taught us. I, in my own mind, I haven't made any connection between the two. I think throwing a frog into boiling water is entirely different than being the frog in, in, in water that's heating up. Um, so I think what we can learn is that complex problems require multi-stakeholder multi solutions. And I think in the case of the pandemic, governments just threw money at that. Um, technologists, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, worked on it night and day. I mean, you know how heroic they were. Um, we just don't have that sense of, of, of emergency. And the truth is, we don't really yet see it as our personal problem in the way, our own safety in the way that we did with the pandemic. A lot of changes happened, but you know, like even last night, there was a kind of big announcement from uh, Twitter saying everyone needs to be back in the office. Goldman Sachs have made, made made similar announcements. Um, do you see? Are you optimistic that that the ways of work um, will will remain changed, or do you yeah, think it was just I, I a, just a pause? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in fact, I'm just writing my follow-on 
HBR article, which, you know, four years really after the last one was published, or the first four years since the pandemic started, there's absolutely no, no question that things have changed. Now, what we're going to see is a lot of differences between organizations, sometimes because of the company themselves. So, for example, the investment bank, banks have a view that to be highly uh, productive, people need to be seeing each other. And I was asked at the very beginning of the pandemic, because Goldman have always said this, what do you think about this? I think it's perfectly reasonable. Um, nobody, nobody's chained to Goldman. If you don't want, if you don't want to be in the office all day, don't don't join Goldman. I mean, the deal is clear. And I think that's really important that you just the, you just make the deal clear. And then of course, there are the consequences to that deal. One is you have to pay people more because for them not being at home. It takes away some of the benefits, so you have to do that. And secondly, there's a whole bunch of really smart people who won't, who won't join you. So you've got to figure all these out, and that's why CEOs are paid so much money. They're paid to figure that out. In general, most organizations are adopting hybrid working uh, for some of their employees. Now, of course, in any company, in fact, so I, I've just written a case on Mars, uh, and you know, Mars have factory workers and they have office workers. Well, the factory workers are tethered. You know, I went round a, a, a factory yesterday, actually, and you, the people cannot work from home. My son's a doctor. He can't work from home. So 50 percent of, of people actually can't work from home. Uh, so then you have to be more creative about, for example, time, the, the, the scheduling of time. And certainly that's what Mars have learned. They've learned that they can reschedule time. So hybrids here. I think it's going to move from just talking about should we be in the office to be more to think more broadly about flexibility. And I think that we also have to acknowledge that pe people who are tethered to their work, we have to think about about flexibility around time just as much as we think about flexibility around place. Mm -hmm. um, and looking forward to the future of work, um, as you mentioned a little earlier on, um, some of us are taking the, 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 the steps to avoid planes. Not, necess not necessarily all of us, <laughs> but uh, there has been, been kind of nudges um, along the way of, uh, of amending work practices in relation to, 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 the, um, to, to the climate. How do you see uh, a net zero workplace functioning and how do you see a net, a net zero career? Well, just thinking about... about um about hybrid, it, one of the questions that I asked myself quite early on in my research about hybrid, which I wrote up for, for my book, Redesigning Work, was if people work from home, are they more likely to reduce their carbon, carbon footprint? And I turned actually to the team at Unilever for the research on that because they, they are quite advanced in terms of their thinking around the use of the office. And what I found, and I've written it up in the book, is that it's a very complex story. So it depends quite a lot on the country you live in. So London, England, for example, I live in Primrose Hill, just around the corner, in an 1840s house, which, which leaks energy at, an, at a massive rate. Having said that, I walk into work, I walked into work today. So you have to balance all these things. So if I lived in, in a house that was incredibly well insulated, then it would be work, you know, working from home would be good, but actually I don't. Uh, and lots of people in, in the UK don't. If it was Denmark, which have much better insulation, then it, it makes sense from a carbon perspective for people to work from home. So that's the first thing. So some homes are very carbon efficient, some aren't. Second thing is travel. Um, you know, if you're commuting into the office every day, uh, unless you're using an, an, an electric train or, or your bicycle, you're also using carbon. So, so, so the, the point is, and this I think is the challenge, isn't it, that you guys face as you think about climate change, is there's no easy response to the question, would it be better to have hybrid work rather than everybody coming into the office? It depends on the office. It depends on the home. It depends on the transport that, that people have. I think in general, commuting is a big part of the carbon footprint. The really big part, and this is a point that Unilever made, is aircraft. So what I think we could really stop doing is flying people into meetings. And of course, technology really helps that. And I know that you know, it might be you know, good on occasion to bring people into meetings and put them on, on planes to do so, but that's the thing you could stop really quickly. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the point that Unilever found in their research. Yeah, yeah, and even even well-meaning groups of people. I'm not sure. As an example, we need forty thousand people a cup. I, 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 if you you get rid of 
Well, 90 percent. <laughs> well, I'm going to Davos uh, in oh, January yeah, Davos, and they'll be all on their private plane. So. Yeah, yeah. Although yeah, I did a... notice they sent me a note last week saying, Linda, if you decide to take the train to Geneva, we will we will subsidise you by 50 percent. Just, kind of, just a couple of observations based on what we're talking about on our, on our office. Um, we have a, a, like a room a, like roughly, roughly this size with, with, with like shared humans and shared desks. Yeah. Um, so you're all, uh, you're all sharing the same lights. You're all sharing the same kind of Wi-Fi connection. You're all sharing the same heating. So in that mm-hmm. sense, it's, it's pretty good. And I don't think that anybody drives in in a petrol car. Well, there you I are. I think every, you everybody's them. either either you're on a bike. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. but on the other hand, though, they must also turn their heating down in their houses when they're when they're in the office. Yeah, um, and and also just on another another kind of related point, um, which and you guys just joining us. Um, and one of the big reasons that he's joining us is because he was also working in a kind of climate type of type type, type of environment, but it was all remote, mm. and he wanted the. Um, sense of team again. He wanted to be able to come into an office. Yeah, I think just, yeah. I think most. It's very unusual for somebody never to want to go into an, in, to meet their colleagues. There are companies that are entirely virtual, and I, I've written about those companies. But in most cases, people, particularly if you're younger, you want to be around other people. And so, I my own advisory company, HSM. Um, is full of well, everybody's there right now in a gorgeous office in Covent Garden. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. So for the uh, kind of the net zero, um, it's assuming we are going to go there in, a, in kind of working life. What are the particular skills that young people should be looking to to engender? What, what skills would you look for um, if you're hiring somebody with a net zero future future in mind? Well, I, I sit on, I in fact chair the World Economic Forum Council on skills. And so when we looked at the future of skills, one of the things that came up really clearly was the fact that more jobs were going to be in the green economy. So I think from an individual perspective, I, I, you know, it's a, it's, it's a mindset, isn't it? I see it in some of my children. You know, some of them have an absolute mindset around you know, low carbon. And you can see that in the fact that they walk and cycle everywhere. They don't take planes ever. They sit at home with, you know, duvets on because they don't put the heating on. They don't eat meat. So I, I can see what that that looks like. I can see what a low carbon life lifestyle looks like. And I think it's amazing that they're doing that. And uh, so I think that's, that's, that's a mindset. I think with regard to the industry, then green jobs, as it were, are a growing part of the industry. And what I, I've written privately, actually, for, for companies, um, p- pieces about the transition into a green economy, what will that mean for skills? The thing that I notice most, actually, as we uh, move into uh, a, a green economy is that the structure of organizations change. So if you think about an oil-based economy, then the large you know, multinational oil companies are enormous and they they function as as well functioning bureaucracies. And I don't mean that as a as a as a down, you know, that well functioning bureaucracies are great to have around. That's why our lights stay on. But actually if you take a look at a green economy, then what you see is a lot more players, a lot more innovation, much more risk in terms of capital risk. Uh, which you know, large companies aren't used to that level of risk. Lots more on, of entrepreneurs, lots of more failures, and so, you know, what you're getting is a movement of skills from learning how to be part of a large, complex bureaucracy to being part of a agile ecosystem with different set different sets of skills in terms of you know how you build fast how you learn fast. You know, for example, one of my areas of interest is the distribution of electricity and just how you how you build the capability to do that. Because of course, in the end, the, 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 the energy companies, the oil companies are moving into becoming energy companies. And so the distribution chains are entirely different. So all of that requires a different mindset. And I think that transition is, is really important. And part of what I talk to my students about here at London Business School is that they are now going to be members of complex stakeholder groups uh, where they've got to learn how to understand other stakeholders. They've got to realize that government and regulations play a really important part in that, where they have to work with companies that are very different from them. And that capacity, the mindset to realize that you're working in 
a multi-stakeholder world is really crucial. One of my worries is that it's very difficult to train people how to do that. You know, that's why, you know, the Energy Club and all the other clubs we have at LBS play a really important role to help our students understand that the world that they're going to inhabit requires them to be empathic and understanding and listening to other people's point of view. No, no, very good points. Um, I know with the with the Energy Club, one of the kind of the most powerful things we had pre-pandemic were the the meetings. You know, we yeah. we were like we had people you know, standing in front of the room giving lectures, and yet the rooms packed full of people. Yeah. And at the end of that, there was a really great connection because you all you all had a networking session afterwards, yeah. and you made and you you made you made really kind of good connections. And that was the time the, in the yeah. Energy Club that I made the connections. In the pandemic, everything moved virtual. Well, we're back again, so you, you're still going to be making connections. And I think that's, I, 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 I'm, a num I'm a member of a number of networks, and part of that is that those connections are really important. You know, it's really important. Um, for example, quite a lot of the new ideas around energy creation and storage will come through entrepreneurs. They'll come through a VCs and private equity. You know, so that that combination is much more complex than, than running an oil company where your main asset is your geologists and the, their capacity to find oil. Uh, that's, that's an entirely different set of capabilities. One of the, the things coming out is um, you've got a very strong sense of like the human in all of this. Um, the climate change debate or climate emergency, climate trans energy transition uh, debate has been it's pretty impersonal, you know, and, and it's pretty much kind of focused in, in on kind of like big numbers. Um, why do you think the human element is missing from the kind of climate transition uh, discussion? That's a really good question. You know, one thing we know about the human brain is it likes stories more than it likes data. Now, yours may be different, and, but, but certainly in general. So that's why if you read my books, I always bring personas in. I always talk about people. I mean, often made up people. And I say that this is a made up person because if you're trying to impart, for example, one of the things that I'm concerned about is, is, is you know, as people age, how do they do that productively and healthily? So rather than in a book giving people masses of data about aging, what I do, and Andrew Scott and I did this in our 100-year life and indeed in our next book that we wrote together, The New Long Life, is we, bring, we brought in personas, people, people's stories, and we weave the data into it. So, you know, we'd say, uh, this is Sally, or, or, you know, she lives in, a, in the UK and she's one of, you know, 50% of people who da-da-da-da. And so when I work with companies and advise companies, I always advise them to use personas, not just to... Now, I think the difficulty with the climate change, which is a bit like smoking, really, what, what they found with smoking campaigns, as you know, is that when you confront people with these terrible lungs and so on, they just look away. And I think that's, that's the challenge that you face, isn't it? Is that the reality is so terrible that people want to look away and say, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to talk about this. And how you then connect to the human. I think really you connect to humans through habits, rituals, and practices and processes. Human behavior is not created, but it's actually shaped by our everyday routines, our everyday habits. So for example, one of my everyday habits is I don't get into the car to come here. I always walk even when it's raining. I have a, a rain, a raincoat that I wear. It's just a habit. And the more I do it, the more I like it. So I hardly ever get into the car. Um, I went to the Barbican last night to listen to the marvellous London Symphony Orchestra. I walked there. It take, took me 65 minutes, but I did that. So what, what, what you have to do, I think, and when I say you, I mean those of you who, who are really leading the charge, and it's brilliant that you are, you have to help people think about <clears throat> what would be the daily habit, the daily routine that would make a difference. Now, I know that people think it's too big for me. You know, I can't do anything about it. It's too, it's too. But actually what we know is that when people change their habits, they also begin to engage in some of the bigger questions. You know, so the fact that I walk to work makes me feel better about how I feel about climate change, even though what I'm doing is 
is a is a minor minor thing. So then over time you expand those habits. You know maybe the next thing is I say I'm going to cut back on flying. That might be the next thing. I'm going to take the train to Davos. So, but those things those are steps. You know we learn our habits by increasing them. So I think the more that that you can do that. I mean that the the, the health has been really good at that. This ten thousand steps, which is as you know completely made up. Actually, people will say to each other, "How many steps have you done today?" You know, and here it is. I've got it on my. I can tell you exact. Yeah. So that's the sort of thing that if you can relate this to people's everyday habits and make them feel great about what they've done, then I think that's part of it. But of course, that's just to do with individuals. You also have to work at the level of corporations, and that's because corporations and 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 governments. Play a regulatory role, which is beyond anything that individuals can do. Yeah, yeah, and there's, a, I guess, a danger that people may think, "Oh, sure, I recycle and I walk into work." Um, when I get into work, I don't need to do anything about it. Well, that then, so that your your role is to help them know their habits once they get into work. So, I would like to know what should I do now that I'm in work that would make a difference. And I think you know. As I said, building on these habits bit by bit, bit by bit, it's like you know, couch potato to five k. It isn't that they say to you day one, run five k. Day one, they say walk to the end of the road. That's that's the that's the app that t- takes you from couch potato to running five k. It takes months, and every day it builds on it. I think that's really what we need to think about with humans is to build. Habits and routines that, bit by bit, that we get reinforced for, that move us in the right direction. Yeah, I think we we put, we need more academics to be uh, thinking about about that and what it might look like for particular industries and uh, you know for particular types of companies. I think companies. that's a good point actually, and I think that um, you know it's interesting at London Business School now we're trying to pull all the academics together who are interested in climate change. But really, you know, we should have been doing that years ago. For example, I've just talked to you about habit formation. We have people at London Business School who look at habit formation. Could you help us think about what would be the habits around? How would you create habits around uh, reducing your carbon footprint? So, I agree with you that there's that you know a more focused approach in in schools like ours could be a real help. And your job is to. Is to push London Business School along that path. I'm speaking to, to some of your some of your colleagues about helping, and um, one of the one of the initiatives that London Business School signed up to, and with great with great fanfare, with like Harvard Business Review article and uh, Financial Times um, article, uh, was the the Business Schools for Climate Initiatives. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, it, on paper, if if it achieves half of what's written down, yeah. it'll be a really good initiative. Well, wouldn't it be great if every single person who graduated from London Business School had a clear and articulated view of what they could do and what they as individuals what they could do as a team and what they could do as a corporation when they start leading companies one of the reasons i stay at london business school and love teaching is well i've been here for 30 years and we had our alumni you know coming back as you know last week and there are people leading major companies whom i taught 30 years ago and that's a great feeling that you could have impacted. In fact, some of them say you you made a difference to, to the way I think about being a leader. And I think that's what we've got to really engender, isn't it? That every single person who lead who leaves London Business School as a as they become leaders, they know what it is they're supposed to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. What I would love to see is for um, kind of sustainability to be parts of the the MBA, like it's just a core a core component of it. But we can do that. I mean, we are doing that. So, as you know, what we're doing at the moment is at least making the thread. So, for example, people didn't realise that I teach a whole class on sustainability in my future of work. I get the head of strategy for Shell to come in and talk about this is how our scenario planning is going. This is what we're thinking about the future. Um, and of course, lots of people also said, do you realize that I'm also doing this? So we are joining up the dots. And in the second year, we are providing a thread, which is a sustainability thread. So our students that are interested in sustainability know which electives they should be taking to help them along the path. 
Fantastic, fantastic. So changing, changing tack a little bit. Um, you wrote, you've studied kind of BP's kind of Beyond Petroleum um, campaign in the early 2000s, but now um, the oil and gas majors seem to be doing an awful lot better in mm. their in their messaging and in, in their transitioning. Uh, what do you see the difference between you know the 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 less successful and the more successful uh, companies that are are making this transition? Well, it's a sector that's has to and will transform. And, and for me, it's, it's like the telecom sector. If you look at AT&T or British Telecom, they had to go through massive transformations as they moved from fixed lines, telephones, I don't know if you remember having a telephone and a fixed line, to you know the internet and digital. And actually, although people didn't notice that transition, it was a massive transition. It required laying off a lot of people, reskilling people, and so on. Um, the transition that the oil companies face, you know, either as an oil company, you say, I am just going to get the stuff out of the ground as efficiently as possible, and then we we close it. I mean, you know, this is all we are. And I think that's, you know, I can see why some companies are just, they might not be saying that, but that's really what their strategy is. Um, I think a, 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 a better strategy is to use the enormous resources they've got, both money resources, but also skill resources to make that transition. But that transition is extremely difficult for an oil company because the what it takes to run an oil company is not anything like what it takes to run an integrated energy system. Uh, it's The energy system uh, integration is a high risk business. It's made up of multiple partners that have to be worked together. It's got complex regulate, regulation. And so, you know, one of the questions that you could legitimately ask as an outsider is, would any of the oil companies be able to make that transition? Are, are they capable of doing that? Wouldn't it be better for them just to stick to getting oil out of the ground, which we need? I mean, if we didn't have oil, the lights wouldn't be on. We all know that. Uh, or and let another ecosystem develop, which doesn't involve them. I think there's a lot to be said for helping them to make the transition. And one of the things that I do now with a number of oil companies is to help them think about what that transition looks like. It's basically a transition that looks at skills. You have to reskill in a very, very significant way. It's a transition that looks at structures. You have to move from a, a, a bureaucracy to a much more distributed uh, organization. And it's also, importantly, a transition about risk. When you think about running an oil company, you're looking at a 50-year horizon, probably sometimes longer than that. If you're in, a, in an energy company where you've got multiple sources of energy, sometimes your risk is very, very short. You have to very quickly make high-risk decisions, some of which are going to fail. So there's also a mind shift in terms of how people think about risk and how they think about um, you know, the resourcing for risk. So these are very complex transitions. I, I feel that it would be great if our majors, our major oil companies, particularly the European ones, were capable of making that transition. Mm -hmm. And it, certainly when we get the head of uh, strategy for Shell to come and talk at London Business School, um, and remember that Shell were one of the companies that pioneered scenario planning. So Shell have been saying for years, this is what's going to happen with climate change. This is what we've got to do. Uh, and they've been running those scenarios. So they come to teach my class actually scenarios to help them think about how do you manage scenarios? How, how do you manage multiple scenarios? You know, they, are, they, are, they have big investment capability. And so I'm hopeful that they can, particularly in Europe, make that transition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You also, you need to have a very understanding investor base. Um, and there's, there's a big kind of divestment movement out of um, oil and gas, which complicates matters. And yeah. so I guess is why, why kind of the US firms, uh, the US majors particularly, have seemed to have been just doubling down on, we'll do what, we'll just keep on doing what yeah. we have been doing and we'll just do it better and cheaper. Yeah. And it's the Europeans who have been trying to, trying to make the transition to prime, like broad, broad sweep generalizations, but trying, trying to make that generalization. Yeah. Be interesting to see how that develops. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have a lot of sympathy for people who, who are who are anti-oil. But but the, the truth is, if you look at the UK energy mix at any point in time, 
we could have a, day, a windy day like that, like today when 20% of our, our energy is created through wind. And tomorrow there's no wind and there's no wind uh, farms working. So that 20% has got to be found like that. How does it found? Well, it's found because you put your gas turbines on or you pull up your, your generators. I think the other thing you guys might do is to make that a lot easier. One of the things that, amaze, that fascinates me is on a daily basis, we know exactly where our energy is coming from in the UK. Just as we look at where, what's happening with the stock market, every single day we should say, isn't it brilliant that 20% of our energy in the UK came from wind? But unfortunately, today is not a windy day, so we've had to fire the gas turbines. I don't think people have any sense of how our energy is created, and it's your fault that they don't. So when you ask, how do you help people understand that? You should be helping them understand where the lights come from, where the electricity comes from, especially for young people, because they, I don't think, have a, an, an understanding that right now, if we took oil out of our energy mix, the lights would go out. Now, they then need to see that every year, renewable energy is increasing. So instead of the FT every single day saying, this is what's happened to markets, they've gone up or down. Why don't you just go straight to the core and every day the FT, FT says, this is, the, ex this is the, the more renewable energy we've put into our system today on a daily basis. The data is already there. Yeah. It, it is there, because I, 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 I see it every day. I do. Fantastic. I do. So, so it's not difficult to compile. It's, it's actually already available in the UK energy markets. You, you do have something similar to that in Denmark. They do, they do give that type of, I don't think it's maybe daily. Well, Denmark but is anyway. great. And of course, Denmark you know, we're, we're really fortunate in the UK because we have the continental shelf mm -hmm. and, and, we, and we're, we have wind. Uh, and I don't think people realise what a huge asset that is for us. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and what one if you have solar panels on your house, you are absolutely in that mindset because, like, you have a look and go, oh, well, I've, "I've spent this amount of money on it. Oh, and that's how much I'm saving today. Oh, brilliant!" Or not? It's like, "Oh, quick! I need to turn on all the lights and <laughs> plug in all the cars. Get the neighbours around, plug in their cars because it's a sunny day." So, people who who have taken that extra step to have a, have a heat pump or have solar panels are already in in that in that mindset. Yeah, It'd be great to have people because there's there's also there's things like in um, uh, in Connecticut uh, where people have been giving grants for just just like things that just seem might seem a little daft but um, for an electric lawnmower. But they see that as the, like, the gateway drug <laughs> to, well, to, to your electric it, cars. It's, it's, just, it's, it's a way of cha changing, your, changing your mindset. Yeah, but we're talking about two different things here. One is people understanding where energy comes from on a daily basis, and the second is their use of it. They need both those data sets. They need to know today 25% of our energy came through wind, and they also need to know, I switched off all my lights, therefore my own personal energy went down. I think it's the combination that's going to be really important to help people, to change people's habits and also understanding of the energy markets. I, I don't think, I think it's extremely poorly described actually. At the moment, and understandably so, people are only really caring about the cost uh, of the energy rather than, the, than how it's made up. You, you might end up in a discussion about, well, how much is that kilowatts cost versus, versus that kilowatts um, on like, like a comparative basis of gas versus wind versus, versus solar. And again, that would, that would help the arguments, certainly today and certainly most of the time towards renewables. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I, I do, I fully agree with you. We do need oil and gas right now. But what we should be doing is uh, investing in more oil and gas infrastructure that locks that in for the next 20 years. So we're, we're still dependent on it. Yeah. If we can be investing more and more in, in, in more renewable sources so that over time we can be, be increasing renewables. Uh, I absolutely and, uh, agree with you. There's no question about that. And going back to your question about what was different about the pandemic, um, the day that everybody had to get people out of the office into their home was a massive investment day. Because when you think about it, companies had to basically, you know, create a, a digital infrastructure that was home-based rather than office-based, and they had to invest in that. So that investment was made very quickly. Whereas I think, as you say, the lock-in 
is is for, for, for oil and gas is still there. So persuading uh, companies to move that investment into renewables is going to be crucial. And of course, that's where governments play a role. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, Julian uh, Birkenshaw mentioned that it, it was three days later you were online um, giving classes. Three days, like after lockdown, it was like you managed to, to get your entire kind of classroom oh, yeah. sessions going. Was Absolutely. That, that's amazing. That's really no, no, amazing. I mean, of course, because we're, humans are very adaptive. Um, what do you see are the like the secrets for an individual rather than a corporation of, of reskilling, of, of like, all continually kind of reinventing your, your skill base to make yourself, you're, you're a continual expert on different things? Yeah, well, it's a mind, it's a sort of mindset of lifelong learning. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the knowledge that your life will change and that as it changes, you need to adapt to those changes. So, um, the more, part of the reason I write books about the future, particularly books that are focused on individuals rather than corporations, like The Hundred Year Life, which has been, Andrew Scott and I wrote that book, it sold almost a million copies. It's been translated into many, many languages. And the reason that it did so well is it addressed the individual. It said, look, it's possible that you're going to live to 100. And if you live to 100, you're going to have to change the way you live from, from, from this moment on. You know, if you're 20, you've got to change any age. You've got to change the way that you live. And I think helping people realize that they're going to live longer, that automation is going to make a huge impact on our lives, both, you know, both in terms of uh, robots and artificial intelligence. Um, that's going, that itself, that knowledge is, a, a, it helps people upskill and reskill. But I, this is a topic, you know, I've been working on for years. And what I've also realized is that corporations and governments play a real, really important role. Corporations in terms of both uh, signaling where they think the skills that are going to be important are, helping people to make those transitions, and governments putting money behind it. And it's that combination of individual agency, personal agency, corporations making the investments and governments realizing. I noticed that this current government, this current, I say current prime minister, is really, really keen on education and upskilling. And maybe that's because he's an MBA student, Very of course. Yeah, Sadly, yeah. not from us. <laughs> um, but actually, you know, he's understood something that I think many of us have known for some years, which is reskilling is absolutely crucial. A big part of what I would really call the Irish economic miracle has been the focus on reskilling, on the, has been the focus on, on continual education. Yeah. From a tiny, tiny base yeah. uh, in the 80s, it has is, it is moved on from strength to strength to strength, really with a, a, a very centrist, predict, predictable government, slightly centre-left, slightly centre-right, depending on which party is in party, so very boring, but just very solid policies on just continuing to, to yeah. double down on, on investment in people. Yeah. And that's, and yeah. we've, we can move, we've moved in, in great strides, and mm. I think really as a result of that. So, my kind of more kind of um, difficult question, because uh, there's a lot of sectors that really struggle, um, and a lot of um, not even sectors, kind of communities that struggle. So, if you're if you're very tied into say say you know kind of coal in the US or even kind of the miners minor, 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 miners uh, strike issues issues in the UK. Um, because of that, that, that type of change, or like fisheries today, today in the UK again, because it's you've got industries that are very much tied into kind of the local community. But change is inevitable. Like, how do you deal with that in a in kind of you know a, a, a sensitive way with the balance between the need for change, but also the need to protect kind of cultural identities? That's a really difficult question, uh, and it's one that I think very few countries have been successful at. Um, at, at confronting. If we take the miners, for example, it was known for many years that coal was not going to, you know, that the UK was not a good place to bring coal out of the ground for a whole set of reasons. But as you said, that was tied into feelings of community. Um, where it has been successful, um, and in some of the, U the US cities that have been coal mining cities, for example, or steel working cities, it's required an enormous focus on signaling what the new jobs are and then ensuring investment in those new jobs and then enabling people to, to upskill and reskill. But when you think about what that is, I mean, th th at the heart of it is 
new industry. And that's been extremely difficult to create in those areas. Part of the reason it works slightly better in the US is the US workforce in general are more mobile. So they're prepared to move from a, a place where that industry has, is, is depleting to a place of you know, growing industry. In the UK and Europe as well, we don't have that level of mobility. Our community links tend to be stronger and deeper. And so it's, it's an extremely difficult problem. And you know, thinking about what is it that a miner could do, you know, if you were trained as a coal miner, what, what are your adjacent skills? And, and part of the challenge that we're facing now with the oil industry is if you take a look at some of the primary oil jobs in the oil industry or the gas industry, how could that person transition to another job? Because what we know about reskilling or upskilling is people do not move from being a, a coal miner to uh, a uh, software programmer. That's not a move that's an easy move. What, what we have to do is to find what we would call adjacency. So to say, what is it that the coal miner does or the steel worker does that actually could then help them move into an, into an intermediary position that then would help them, for example, to become a, a, a programmer. So working out those pathways, and actually in general, the US have been better than we have in the UK at working out what those pathways are. But that's a, a piece of work that all of the uh, gas and oil companies need to be doing now. And, and you saw that in the telecoms, which was the last, in my view, the last major sector change, where AT&T, particularly in the US, uh, built pathways that said, this is how you would move from being you know, a, a linesman looking at digital, looking at the, you know, the lines that are, that are coming into a house to becoming much more d digitally literate because the future really is about digital skills. So encouraging people to develop those is going to be primary to that, that transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, They're just as, as, as an aside, um, over the last 10 days, I've had six different people, all from tech companies, call me and say they're either worried that, they're, they're either have been told that they're they're on the way out, or they're worried that they're going to be on the way out, from like from household names, all of them. So this is not. It's like house prices. You know, the lab, the labour market works a bit like house prices. It becomes overheated, and then it re and it goes down to a more stable. And and this is what's happening. You know, tech companies were very popular. They paid a great deal of money. People went to them, and the tech industry is now re recalibrating and people will move into companies like yours, which is great. I mean, you know, it's creative destruction. This is, this is, and, and part of, you know, if one were to take a Schumpeter approach with the oil companies, you'd say they're oil companies. Once they've done their job, they should be destroyed. That's, that's the end of them. And the people in them should go to other places. And, and, and in a way, that's a, there is an alternative scenario that, that says that, that they, they're not companies that can make transitions. They're companies that take oil out of the ground, and when, they, when they've taken that oil out of the ground, that's it. A lot of very kind of smart and talented people were attracted into into tech, and if, if there's a contraction there and it allows for a, for a leakage of people to be coming into into kind of the energy transition, that's that's a really oh, that's a really, absolutely really good brilliant. Thing. I mean, that's the marvel of labour markets. They're very adaptable, and uh, and they and they and, and labour moves, especially in in some. You know, like in, as you say, in Ireland, where you have a, a real tech hub anyway, they move very easily between sectors. One of the things that the oil companies had to realize is that when they were recruiting some of the new people, they weren't in competition with other oil companies. They're in competition with Amazon and Google. And that, that was a real insight for them to think that actually those are our competitors for the labor market. I was, so I was in the US last week in a, in a room full of people who were all kind of, you know, climate enthusiasts. And uh, the, 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 the overriding feeling was, oh my goodness, this is great. We've got this kind of Inflation Reduction Act and how on earth do we go around and like deploy all of this capital? Like, is it, the problem was too much capital and not enough people, yeah. people to do it. Yeah. Um, how, how, do you, how does your kind of MBA class kind of feel about kind of moving into this, this type of space? Is it, is it, well, is it the I mean, one thing I would say about the MBAs at London Business School at the moment is they're very entrepreneurial. 
Um, I see them wanting to set up their own businesses more than I've ever done before in the 30 years that I've been working at London Business School. And they're going wherever they think either they're passionate or they think the money is. Uh, and sometimes it's a combination of both. So for example, they're setting up a whole bunch of, well, well you know, in the renewable space, they're setting up a whole bunch. So, so that's amazing because the, 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 the energy transition is a transition of many players. It's not a transition of enormous companies, monolithic companies that are that pull all the, the resources into them. It's an ecosystem. And ecosystems are brilliant for entrepreneurs and startups. So I would I think it's wonderful that so many young people are so determined to make a difference and so determined either to set, set up a, prof, a profit or a not-for-profit. Quite a number of them, as you know, are setting up not-for-profits So because they're so passionate about sustainability. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I work quite a bit with the Sustainability Club here. That's a great mm. club. And so, so many wonderful people in there, so many really passionate people who have come out of some quite remarkable careers to come into the MBA, spending a lot of money you know, doing that, to, to retrain to do something they just feel is important. That's, that's and wonderful. of course, you know, one of the things that we're doing at London Business School is increasing the number of scholarships. So part of the reason that I, I joined the, our board, the advancement board, and you know that we've, we've made a target of how much money we'd like to raise, is for my, because of my personal passion about scholarships. You know, I would love to be sitting in a classroom knowing that a high proportion of them did not have the concern about paying back the fees. And I'm particularly passionate about uh, scholarships that are focused on citizens of the African continent. Perfect. Well, that's a really good, um, good to kind of link into um, the you know, the current campaign that London Business School, School are running, kind of um, you know, forever forward, uh, very ambitious. You know, there are some really kind of nice in kind of sustainability threads throughout it. Do you want to, do you want to kind of talk a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah. So, so when we were thinking about what, where, where would we go, like to go next as London Business School, I think that there were a few things that we con wanted to concentrate on. One was scholarships. We wanted, we want more scholarships because the more scholarships you have, the more diverse your group and diversity, as you know, is an amazing facilitator for learning. And also, the less likely they are to, to have to go into highly paid jobs big, to pay off. So, so that for me is the real, that's the real kicker. So we wanted to put more money into scholarships. We wanted to put more money into research. And when we think about research, sustainability is one of the threads that goes through our research. So obviously, we have professors here who entirely focus on sustainability. But what we wanted to do was both to support them but also to grow stronger links between them and the other members of the faculty, who people like me who teach it as part, but it's not sort of the center, the center of what they do. Um, and then, you know, there's obviously investments in buildings and so on, which I won't bore you with. But, but for me, the two major sustainability themes are more scholars, more scholarships, and more uh, money into research centers, particularly around sustainability. Okay, fantastic. Uh, what we uh, normally try and finish up on is a little bit of advice. Um, okay. Yep. Yeah, so um, just speaking to people who might be um, starting out their careers or maybe someone who's just, just finishing up, finishing up their, on their, their MBA and is looking towards a career um, potentially in, in you know, hopefully in renewables, yeah. <laughs> hopefully in sustainability, what advice would you give them for kind of the future of, 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 of like another 70 years potentially mm. of, 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 life, of mm -hmm. life and working life. Yeah. Well, you know, what I say to my MBA students, and I would give this advice to any young person is, first of all, you've got a long life ahead of you. And that gives you a lot of opportunities to do many different things. So the most important thing, I think, is you, you don't have to rush. You know, if you want to go into a startup on sustainability, then do it. You know, be courageous, because even if it doesn't work, there's still plenty of time to retrain to do something else. So I, I would say follow your passion, be courageous and be determined to be a lifelong learner. 
Thank you very much. Oh, uh, my Linda. pleasure. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us on that conversation. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope that you uh, learned something. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and uh, to subscribe to, uh, to any of our channels. And uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. This series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club.